You've researched the autos who have been in South Africa for the last 300 years. In the last 20 years, your research has made it into a 400-page book, and it's quite extensive. So why don't you tell us how you got started? Yeah, it has been a long time. Um, I've been interested in my family tree history since, I guess, since I was about 16 years old, when I went back to South Africa to visit my grandparents, auto grandparents, for the last time. And I asked my grandmother uh, what was her parents' name. I wanted to know what her grandparents' name were. And she said to me, um, why do you want to know, my child? And I said, Oma, I just want to know. <laughs> and I think that's what got me started. Um, so initially, all I wanted to do was do a pedigree chart, um, figuring out what percentage I was German and how, what percentage I was Dutch, and French, and whatnot. And uh, just wanted to find out who my parents, parents, and parents, and parents were. And uh, so I started right roughly around 1995, actively doing this. And uh, I found, I, I got some results, uh, but as a result I got more and more research uh, material sent to me. And I got actually stuck at my one auto great-grandmother. And I kept telling them to send me more material. And uh, eventually, I had a couple of hundred death notices of autos that did not belong to my family. And uh, I eventually just said, well, just send me everything from the archives, because I thought it was only maybe 100 or 200 autos. Uh, turned out, I received about 1,400 death notices from nine archives in South Africa. So, as a result, I had all the source material. I thought, okay, I might as well do a descendants chart. But uh, my initial interest was just to do my pedigree chart. Can you explain the difference for us? Yeah, the pedigree chart is uh, specific to one person, and uh, it is uh, just finding out what your parents, 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 parents were. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I found out that my dad who considered himself a pure Afrikaner, uh, he broke down to 46% uh, uh, Dutch, 26% uh, German, 20% French, uh, he had 3% Flemish, 2% Norwegian, 1% uh, Polish, and he even had uh, uh, Khoisan blood in him, 1% of that. So I am... Um, truly African, uh, and, and so was my father. And so, uh, if we ever wanted to have a, a look at what all of humanity looked like, uh, they would be the Khoisan people. So it's kind of nice to have 1% of the Khoisan uh, blood running through your veins. Um, also, when I looked back, uh, I, I did a uh, genographic uh, test, they sent me out a kit, you swab you the inner cheek of your, uh, the skin of your in inner cheek, and you send it back and uh, they'll tell you who your father's father's father was and who your mother's mother's was. And it turns out that um, all of humanity originate in Africa. And uh, so roughly about, uh, um, actually about 800,000 years ago, there were three groups of people. Uh, there were the early humans, which, whom they called the Cro-Magnums, living in Africa. You had a group, the Neanderthals, living in uh, Germany and uh, Europe. And you had a group called the Denisovans, living in Asia. And these three groups uh, didn't mix for a very long time. And about uh, 60,000 years ago, when uh, the Sahara Desert bloomed and got wetter, it allowed the people to move through the Sahara Desert out back into Europe. And that was the first time that these Cro-Magnums, our ancestors, were able to meet the other uh, two peoples. 
So today, the uh, <clears throat> people of uh, Asia, uh, Eastern Asia, would have a, a couple of percent of uh, Denisovans in them. Uh, Europeans do not have Denisovan blood in them, but they have uh, Neanderthal blood in them. So all Europeans have roughly uh, about 3-4% uh, Neanderthal uh, blood in them. And so uh, our particular line went out of Africa, they went east to northern India, then turned back around, and uh, about 15,000 years ago settled in the Ukraine, somewhere in the Ukraine. Um, and that is the early history uh, that you can find out through the uh, genographic uh, project and basically all autos would share the same history. So tell me the story of the autos. Well we've only had last names for basically the last thousand years. So uh, uh, Italy started with them uh, and then about a hundred years later uh, Germany started with uh, last names and it took about 200 years after that for the general population to all have last names. So in Germany you can basically go back about 700 years uh, to get a last name. So my research have shown that all autos originate from one place and uh, worldwide there's roughly about uh, 100,000 autos uh, about 35,000 would be in the United States, about 35,000 in Germany, and uh, the rest of the world would have the rest. Uh, South Africa, the descendants of Mikhail Otto and the other 33 uh, autos that went to South Africa, they represent roughly about 8-9% of all the autos. So we were this early auto, before he even had his last name, must have moved from the Ukraine to Chemnitz, which is in the southern part of Germany. And uh, at that part, they were coal miners, and around, uh, I was able to go back to about 1450. And uh, that's the earliest autos that I could find directly back from uh, Mikhail Otto. Mikhail uh, Otto, he uh, must have moved for economic reasons. I'm suspecting that his parents, he moved maybe with his parents. He was born in Chemnitz, right on the border of Czech Republic, uh, but he moved along, uh, people used to move along river uh, roadways. Uh, there was rudimentary roads throughout Europe, which basically built during the uh, Roman times, and they were very slow and not much commerce was going along there, so uh, for him to make a move all the way to where he went, which was the northern Baltic coast town of Stetten in Germany, he had to have followed the river routes, so there would have been ships and all that, so they were looking for employment. The part where he was born was economically depressed at the time, and uh, the northern uh, parts near, actually near Holland, was where the economy was booming. So every young man, every, and so he probably moved with his parents to uh, Stetten. And in fact, he identifies himself as somebody who's from Stetten. And um, that's where the story starts. So he's uh, probably a teenager uh, with his parents living in Stetten. So Michael Otto is growing up and living in Stetten, Germany and the main father of all of the autos in South Africa. Where does the story in South Africa come together? How did he get there? Well, uh, ship travel had just become mainstream. Prior to that, it was just the explorers, really, that uh, did uh, any ocean-faring uh, shipping. Uh, there would have been some uh, shipping around different coastal towns, but to go across oceans and all that, it wasn't the average person that did that. And even by the 1700s, uh, there's a mass exodus of people out of Europe 
over to North America and to, to the colonies and whatnot. But even by that standards, uh, Michal Otto was a wanderer. He really did. Uh, because what he does then is he leaves um, Stetten and he goes to a place called uh, Trondheim in, uh, in Norway, which is just below the Arctic Circle. And I don't know how long he was there, but uh, he doesn't appear that he took his family with either. So here he is, probably in a place by himself, it is very cold there. Also, uh, in the winter when he decided to leave, it was about uh, 22, 23 hours of darkness there. Uh, he would have seen the northern lights. He would have uh, probably seen icebergs on the ocean. That's uh, quite different from where he grew up. So, uh, I think what he did was perhaps a friend of his or whatever, uh, got him to join uh, the uh, VOC or the Dutch East Indian uh, Company, who was the largest company in the world, in fact, historically the, the greatest company ever. And uh, I guess he was looking for employment and uh, secure employment, like all young people are doing, and uh, got himself a job. And they picked him up on their ship from Trondheim probably late January uh, 1714 and they're close to the Arctic Circle in the darkness uh, he decided to go uh, join this company he had, a, he had to sign a five-year commitment with them and they could have signed him anywhere and they told him you're going to the Cape of Good Hope so Michael Otto is making his way down to Africa. What is life like in Africa? What are the conditions? What is he expecting when he gets there? Uh, the Cape of Good Hope is an interesting place. It's sort of a halfway house, um, halfway stop where people get refreshments. Uh, the company did not want to uh, invest any money in the halfway house. They wanted to get the wealth from the east uh, to Europe and uh, so basically they were just stopping there to get supplies. So the people who stopped there were needed to provide the produce uh, for the ships and uh, so all kinds of, I won't, don't want to call them misfits, but people who did not make it in Europe the, for economic reasons, they wanted to get a new start. Uh, people seeking adventure, um, people who were running for, uh, from Europe for religious reasons. So uh, this was a combination of all types of people coming in, basically from France, uh, Germany, all over uh, Europe, but mostly from France, Germany, and the Netherlands. So that's the early uh, immigration, uh, immigrant group. Uh, at the time that uh, Michiel would have arrived at the Cape, there, my rec my uh, records show that there were uh, 744 officials at the time, 2,000 farmers, and about 2,700 uh, slaves. So you had a community of a little over 5,000 people in a town uh, that was referred to as the uh, taverns, tavern of the sea, or ta tavern of, yeah, tavern of the sea. So. A place where there were would have been ships in the harbor um, all the time, probably about seven, eight ships at a time, and there would have been uh, sailors walking through the towns. Remember, Van Riebeek had only been he just started the colony about 60 years earlier, so you know wildlife is starting to recede from the Cape. Uh, the native population, which would have been the Khoisan are uh, in and among them, but also uh, moving away. And it's becoming a bit of a settlement. Um, at this location, Farg uh his future wife was in the meantime busy with her life. So around uh, 1700, 
uh, Adrian van der Stel, who was the governor of the uh, Cape, he sort of secretly built this place. It was, uh, the land was four times the size of an average uh, farm that was granted to free burghers. Uh, and a free burger was someone who after five years of service uh, was granted some land and then he became uh, his own boss. So, Farkenlirchen is now four times as big as the average uh, farm and uh, he builds this wonderful estate and puts up um, vineyards and, and uh, apparently it was located ideally for farming and particularly for, far, uh, for uh, a winery. And till today they have some of the best wines. So uh, he, he builds this place six years later, 1706, they just completed this place. The local settlers find out about it they are up in arms because he's been using the slaves and the funds of the colony to uh, finance the building of this place. And word gets back to the Netherlands, and he is shipped back to the Netherlands. For th three years, they decide what to do with this place. So in uh, 1709, they finally decide they want to destroy it. Mm -hmm. That's what the farmers demanded. They decide to divide it into four farms, and uh, today there's four big farms around here, and uh, the house uh, was sold off, and a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Adrian von der, oh, sorry, Barend Kaldenes bought the place. And a year later, 17, 1710, he marries his 15-year-old who becomes the future great, 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 great grandmother of all uh, the Michal Autos of South Africa. Her name is uh, Anna Sick. And uh, so this 15 year old gets into this uh, estate and she lives with her husband. She has uh, six children with him and he dies in 1721. Uh, sorry, yeah, 1721, and uh, Mikhail Otto, in the meantime, he's still back in Trondheim, uh, working his way, and of course we know in 1714, he's on his way down uh, to, the, to the Cape, and uh, he has no idea what his future is going to be like, he just knows he has a five-year contract with the... Uh, uh, Dutch East Indian Company. So Michael Otto has just made it to Cape Town and Anna Seek is already married and has a couple of kids and uh, his, her husband dies so uh, obviously there's a love connection that's about to be made. How do they meet? So in uh, two days, 300 years ago, uh, Michael Otto arrives at the Cape and he sees Table Mountain for the first time and he's going to work for the uh, Dutch East Indian Company for five years and uh, at the conclusion of that he was now a free man, a free burger and uh, he marries a lady by the name of uh, Barbara Contramon. Now he was German and uh, most of the community there would have been Dutch and some French there and so uh, it's not clear uh, what languages he spoke but Jeff definitely he would have been speaking a high Deutsch which is a high German and uh, the Dutch of the day would have been sort of like a low German and so he would have understood what what they're all about but he and of course working with him for five years he probably would have learned Dutch by that time but it seems that he married a German lady. Uh, she dies uh, two years later, uh, uh, 1721, the same year as what um, uh, Barent Haldenes dies. And so now both um, Anna Sick and Michael 
Otto, they're both a uh, widow and widower. And uh, he's in Cape Town, uh, three days by auction uh, travel out here. Somehow they meet. Uh, meet uh, probably late uh, 1721. They got married uh, 1722. And uh, he be with the marriage, he becomes the landlord of this Fachliachen. And the next year they had their uh, first child, who is also uh, the only son that they had. And so here, uh, Mikhail Otto, uh, a single man, uh, well, a widower, uh, after he's now getting married with this lady, who's now <clears throat> Anna, who, who's desperate, uh, because uh, she's got six kids, she's got this estate to run, she's got this young man that uh, could take care of her, so she is somewhat desperate and she's happy that she can find him. He, probably looking at this property and coming here and seeing it, uh, he also feels that he's gotten a good deal. So, uh, 1722, I think they're a fairly happy couple and uh, both uh, are satisfied with the choices that they've made. And she's and I, of Dutch descent? She's of Dutch descent. So by that time, I guess he's not that picky. Remember, there were very few uh, women uh, in um, the, the, the Cape, Cape Province at the time. Uh, she would have been, at the time, I guess, uh, well, he would have been 20... Uh, he, he would have been, th sorry, he's 33 and she's 26 at the time. So there's about a eight year, seven year uh, difference between them. And uh, like I said, the next year, two, uh, 1723, he, they have their first uh, son. And then the remaining uh, seven, well, they had eight children in total. This, the, the remaining seven children were all uh, girls. And so all autos descend from their first son. History is not kind to Michael Otto. Can you tell us why? In uh, Otto Frederick Menzel's book uh, entitled Cape of Good Hope, published in 1787, uh, there are some serious allegations made against Mich Michael Otto. Uh, in, in that, they refer to him, and the, the, the people of the time refer to him as Michael the Ox. Apparently, he was um, very cruel to his uh, slaves, and uh, apparently on this very property uh, would have done cruel things to them. And uh, the other burghers would have known about that, and they used to threaten their slaves and say, you know what, if you don't behave yourself, you don't do what I'm asking you to do, then I'm going to send you to uh, Michil the Ox. These are allegations, and they are uh, made 60 years, uh, you know, later, uh, 50 years later. Uh, so, if if true, it, it shows you how long those stories lingered, and uh, so they would have been horrific. Um, and that's uh, it's a uh, it's a sad chapter for him and. Uh, he divorced his wife uh, in uh, 1741, um, and he went down to the to Cape Town, just abandoned his young family, and uh, opened up a tavern there. And uh, according to the history here, he was his own best customer at his ta tavern, and two years later, uh, he died. So it's a sad end uh, to Michiel Otto. Um, there's also a record of his son having been called up to um, go and look for slaves that have taken off into the wilderness where the wild animals still were and uh, where uh, the Khoi Khoi and Khoisan were not friendly to anybody, including slaves. And they chose to rather go out there than uh, be with their slave owners, which could, which kind of tells you what life was like uh, being a slave. 
And uh, he, he decided uh, he did not want to uh, do that. And in fact, uh, he got in trouble with the law. This is now uh, Michael Jr. Because I think he probably saw firsthand what his dad did and just thought, you know what, this is wrong. And I'm not going to help uh, these slave owners get their slaves back. The, um, his son, whom I'm descended from as well, which would be the grandson of Michael Otto, uh, C9, uh, his name is Andres Otto, he tells a bunch of missionaries uh, around 1780 or whatever and said, you know, these Khoi Khoi would accept Christ, uh, but it's these wicked Christians, land owners, who are constantly going out and uh, uh, basically hunting down Khoi Khoi. And he said one time, one uh, hunting expedition, they shot uh, 300 uh, Khoi Khoi. So, uh, I think this is a testament to Anna Sick for how well she brought up her children and how Michil Otto uh, B1 brought up his children so that they can see uh, right and wrong and, and be on the right side of history uh, 300 years later. Previously, you referred to C9, A1, B2, or B1, rather. Can you just tell us a little bit about this coding system, uh, what, it, what it means, or how, is, how are you identifying people, and uh, how it works? Initially, I had no idea what the family tree looked like. Uh, so that is sort of the, f the final result. Um, I had as I said earlier, gotten the 1,300 uh, death notices, uh, got another additional 700 uh, documents, so in total over 2,000 of them. They were spread all over the uh, family room uh, for a period of about a, a year as I pieced together the family tree. And so the way it works is everybody that comes to South Africa is considered, every auto is considered an A. So the first auto to come in is A1. The second auto to show up to South Africa is A2, A3. And there was 33 autos that showed up. And our auto is the first auto, so he's A1. His children are all Bs, so it's B1, B2, B3. So they're and, A1, B1? And right, so, you, so uh, Michal Otto's son would be A1, B1. And of course, he had those seven other daughters, so there, there was up to B8. And then the next generation would be C1, C2, C3. And uh, for convenience, I separated the families into family uh, branches. So uh, you've got uh, major branches uh, where Michiel Otto's grandchildren were... Uh, uh, he had, uh, there were 16 of them, and three of them were uh, were boys that had descendants. And at C3, C9, and C16. So all Michael Otto's descendants descend from those three grandsons. And then within that, there would be, they would all have their Ds and they would have their Es. And the picture that I have there is going down to the fifth generation and creating these family branches. So in my case, I am A1, B1, C9, D1, E6. And so is everybody in the C6s. And uh, there are some branches that have died out and some branches that are really large. So you would expect them to be all about the same size, but that artist rendering there basically shows you the size of the branches. Now, uh, also, the John Frederick Otto, who came in in 1788, he had six sons, and so there are six branches for them as well. And then, of course, there's the other uh, 31 little tiny families. 
17 of them have died out already, and there's no male descendants, and a couple more are in danger of dying out. Are they related in some way? Um... Right. All autos, in my belief, are related back to Europe. They may not be related inside South Africa, but they all tie back to one uh, European auto. So yeah, we all we all are family. Um, and uh, so, with this branches here, uh, I was able to uh, place people according to their uh, family trees uh, and their branches. And so, if you are in a particular branch, you may know. Uh, somebody else there they'd be like a second or third cousin so you may or may not know them but definitely if you have the same branch code uh, you are closely related to that other relative and do you have any final thoughts uh, well I have enjoyed this uh, time of research and just basically self-indulgence uh, discovering my family and uh, I have to say I've met many uh, wonderful people along the way. Uh, in the process, I wrote uh, 814 letters to people at one shot. Uh, I've called hundreds of people, probably thousands of emails. Uh, and uh, most people have been very, very generous with their time and the information that they provided me. Uh, I am hugely impressed by the auto women, they, uh, whether they are the daughters or whether they are the spouses, the, the wives. Uh, they are very good at uh, keeping the family heritage alive and uh, showing an interest in uh, promoting uh, families and I guess that's sort of a motherly thing um, and uh, one particular family branch the Natal Autos they are amazing these poor guys are almost uh, extinct I think there's uh, one boy four or five year old boy that's uh, uh, right now the only one that's left out of a family that, that was about five percent of all the autos and uh, of course I have a couple of heroes. I have uh, Moira Tarr who wrote uh, the Natal Autos, a wonderful lady and she and I collaborated uh, many years ago and uh, uh, she made a huge contribution and of course uh, every family has that nutty aunt that um, you know wants to remember your birthdays and all that sorts of things and that's what family is all about. Uh, it's showing that we care, and it's a sign that um, of a society, advanced society, where they care for the young, the uh, elderly, the misfortune, and also uh, for those that have passed on. Uh, you uh, really don't. If you if if you if you've left no legacy, if you've uh, if there's no one to remember you, uh, then it's almost as if you haven't uh, lived at all. The Egyptians have this uh, had this belief that uh, as long as there were people uh, on Earth that could remember you and honor your memory, then you live on in the afterlife, and you only really die in the afterlife if there was no one here to remember you. And so that's why they built pyramids and all that sort of thing. So. Hopefully every time that somebody opens up one of our books and uh, looks up their ancestors, uh, you're paying homage to your, your ancestors. Now one other little uh, thing to add uh, along the way, these are sort of just little side benefits. I, I've had numerous of pe people requesting information about uh, relatives that they've lost contact with and I've helped uh, many of them find their uh, siblings and that. One of them I had, two of them were on my Facebook group and neither of them knew 
that they were brothers and sisters. And uh, I had the parents of the one and the parents of the other one. And uh, I just contacted the one and said, do you realize you've got a brother? And, uh, you know, today they, they are family and they've, um, you know, they're, they're, they're reunited through this hobby. I had one person that uh, called me from England, um, no, actually from South Africa, and gave me a request and I said, okay, I'll try and figure it out. And about two weeks later, somebody from England called me with the same request and the same names. And I said, oh my God, do you realize you've got... Providence. You have a sister. So here are two people, continents apart, a brother and sister, searching at the same time, reaching the same person on another continent, and uh, there had to have been some connection where two siblings are looking for each other at the same time, making the same connections, and apparently uh, there wasn't much sleep going on that night between the correspondence going on between uh, the family in England and the family in South Africa. And those were some of the extra bonuses with this uh, hobby. And, uh, well, we've had 300 years, and uh, so I look forward uh, to families making more connections and, uh, and just keep continuing on with this uh, hobby. Thanks.